Thank you so much for the um, introduction. Um, yeah, so the, the topic of my talk is when AI disrupts the law, and I want to look at questions of fairness and privacy when it comes to um, advertising. So the talk is centered around a piece of work that I just recently released, um, a paper that is called Affinity Profiling and Discrimination by Association in Online Behavioral Advertisement. Um, the paper is fully available if somebody wants to have a look. But the basic story is that I was interested in the question how online targeting mechanisms are influencing us and how they affect us in an ethical and legal way. And I got inspired by that story because I realized, and I think most of us realize, that every time we interact with some kind of technology, digital technology, there is some advertising attached to it. It is almost impossible to access any digital service without being served advertisements. And there are some advertisements that are relatively harmless. So, for example, we all know um, Netflix recommendation system where based on your viewing habits, they might offer you some new suggestions for movies or series. And similar here with Amazon, where based on your um, shopping behavior, they might offer you products that might be very interesting. Both of those examples, ethically speaking, are not terribly um, interesting. They might be a bit annoying. Um, for example, here, where one of the users gets regularly offered new, exciting <laughs> offers for toilet seats um, because she recently purchased one. So that might be annoying, but it's not particularly ethically challenging. But of course, this is only one part of the truth. There is actually some troubling evidence where we have to think about maybe new safeguards. Um, here, one example has to do with price discrimination. So algorithms can be used to offer different prices for the same product to different groups of people. And this can be done, for example, based on geolocation. It could be based on the fact whether you're using um, a PC or a Mac, for example. So you get the same product at a different price. That could have ethical consequences. And even more troubling is here the um, example of Facebook, which have been recently in the news with a lot of things. And one of them has been that they have been um, allegedly inferring very sensitive attributes about the users, inferring ethnicity, inferring um, political affiliation, sexual orientation, gender. And you use that information to either specifically target those people or to exclude them from the market completely. And that um, has happened in the past. They have now announced to change their policies in certain ways. But Facebook and other um, advertising companies still use very troubling um, tools to target people. And one of the things that they use is they use all the data that we basically leave behind. They use the web pages that we visit, the videos that we watch, the articles that we read, um, our geolocation, everything we post on social media, languages, age, and all of that. The basic argument that a lot of those companies actually make is that they're not inferring something sensitive about you as a person, they're just assuming an affinity. The basic argument is that I'm not inferring whether your ethnicity, I'm just assuming that you have an affinity with a certain ethnicity. And therefore, the argument is made that affinity, assumed affinity, and personal traits are different things. If we take that argument seriously, it could actually disrupt a lot of legal safeguards that we currently have. A couple of them I've listed here. If we accept the argument that affinities and interests are different than personal traits, what does it mean for data protection? Data protection is based around the idea that your personal data, the data that is about you, should be protected. What does it mean for non-discrimination law, which operates under the assumption that you should not be treated adversely because of your protected traits, sensitive traits? And what does it mean for untraditional groups? What if algorithms are creating groups that we don't understand, that we don't have a concept for, and how can we protect those people? So I'm going to try to talk about, very briefly about all those three things. And the first thing, as I said, is, has to do with data protection. Um, and the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, that came into force last year. And the GDPR actually has a lot of interesting safeguards here with regard to sensitive personal data. And it says that um, data that directly reveals something sensitive about you, for example, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or indirectly reveals something about you that is sensitive, has higher standards of protection. So it's personal data and data that is by inference sensitive. And once this seemingly by name data is transferred into sensitive data, you get more protections. Unfortunately, the court sees it a bit differently. 
um, the European Court of Justice has um, recently um, issued a judgment that could be troubling in that regard. The background story of that case was that somebody wanted to have access to the names of the personal assistants of some members of the European Parliament. And those personal assistants said, I don't want this information to be disclosed because you can assume, infer, what kind of political views I have. Argument being, if I'm working for somebody uh, for the Green Party in the European Parliament, you could assume that I'm in favor of Green Party politics. And the court said, no, that's not good enough to turn something that is non-sensitive into sensitive because two conditions have to apply. First of all, you have to have the intention to infer something sensitive. And second of all, the data that you're using has to be reliable to make that inference. And the court said, just because you're working for somebody, that's not a reliable basis to infer whether you have the same political opinions as your boss. And therefore, um, protection wasn't granted. Again, this is problematic, and this is how legal opinion um, might be in need of, of further development because AI might disrupt that concept. Um, intention from an AI perspective is not necessary to infer something that is sensitive. If you use strong proxy data, for example, um, geolocation, which strongly correlates with um, ethnicity or sexual orientation or gender, it doesn't matter if you have the intention to infer that. This information will be baked into the algorithm nonetheless. And the question of reliability is also a bit of a red herring because that's actually a really important question. Is it really important if you can, um, with confidence, rely something sensitive? Or is the question whether you assume something sensitive about a person and then try to treat them differently? Here with the example where Facebook inferred sexual orientation and used that to target people. Is it really important to accurately infer your sexual orientation? Or is it the adverse treatment that follows from that? So I think in terms of data protection, we need to think a bit differently. The second point has to do, as I said, with uh, non-discrimination. Um, and how that might be disrupted by AI technologies. Just very briefly, I'm not going to go into detail how non-discrimination law generally works. Um, the law protects us for two types of discrimination. One is direct discrimination, and one is indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination means I treat you differently, adversely, because of one protected attribute. For example, I'm telling you I'm not going to hire you because you're a woman. That's direct discrimination, which is prohibited. More complicated is the notion of indirect discrimination. Here I use a neutral provision criterion of practice applied to everybody equally, but it just so happens that a particular group that is protected suffers a disadvantage. So for example, if I'm saying I'm only going to hire people that are taller than one meter and 80, I'm not directly discriminating based on gender, but it will have an effect on women because on average they are shorter than men. So those are the types of discrimination um, cases that we have. Um, protection that we have. Going back to the argument that your affinity and your interests are not the same as your personal traits, what would that mean for discrimination law? If it's not about you, I cannot claim direct discrimination because you're not treating me differently because of something about me. It's just my affinity. And with indirect discrimination, yes, of course, you could still bring a claim under that, but there were certain hurdles that are attached to it, right? If you classified with a certain group, you might not want to out yourself. For example, if you're being classified as Christian, but actually you're Buddhist, you don't want to disclose your religious belief of other people. And the second reason has to do with misclassified users. Maybe um, the algorithm assumes that you're Christian when you're in fact Buddhist, but you experience the adverse treatment nonetheless. And because algorithms are not necessarily 100% accurate, um, that could mean that you are not the target and might not get any protections under that. And here I try to come up with an idea to close um, that kind of um, gap that we currently face with an idea that is called discrimination by association, which is, as, as I said, the, um, the, the paper that I just published. Discrimination by association goes back to an interesting case uh, a couple of years back where um, Ms. Coleman sued her employer. She sued her employer um, because she felt discriminated based on disability. The background story was that she wanted to have more flexible working hours to take care of her disabled kid. She was not granted that privilege and eventually she was actually dismissed. And she went to court and said, I feel discriminated um, against um, disability because other people in the same firm were granted those privileges for their non-disabled children. And the argument came up to say, well, you cannot claim discrimination based on disability because you are not disabled, it's your kid. And the court said, no, this argument doesn't hold 
because this is discrimination by association. You don't have to be a member of the protected group. You don't even have to possess the protected attribute. If you suffer negative consequences because of your association, your affiliation, your closeness to a protected group, then you should be granted the same protections as well. And the court said that's true for direct discrimination, like in this case, but it's also true for indirect discrimination, which is might, might be harder to spot. So that could help us to close the current gap that we have in the framework. There's still some work to go, um, and I think the only thing how we can open that is actually to open up the black box of algorithms to bring a successful claim if you think there are discrimination issues. Because obviously, if you want to bring a claim, you need to show that you have suffered a particular disadvantage. As I said, price discrimination could be one of those examples. In the, in the offline world, it's relatively easy. You go to Tesco's or Sainsbury's or Waitrose and you compare prices. You choose the product that you think is the most valuable, that has the best offer for you, and you go out. If Tesco's all of a sudden decides not to let you into the store anymore, you know that you have been excluded from the market. The same cannot be done in the online world. I don't know what other prices are out there. I don't know if I'm being shown the best deal. And I'm not sure if I'm actually being shown all the advertisements that are out there. I don't know if I'm excluded from the market. And that's something where we actually need more um, opening up and have businesses being more transparent about their practices. And the second thing has to do is that I need to show that the treatment is disproportionately affecting a protected group. And here again, algorithmic um, intransparency is posing a problem because I don't know who I'm being grouped with. I don't know of what part I'm, uh, what, what the member of a group I am. I don't know who else is in that group, and I don't know how those people are being affected. So bringing a claim under that could be problematic because of algorithmic um, transparency problems. Nonetheless, I think starting from the idea, a more creative idea, to think about discrimination by association could, at least in theory, help us a bit because it would give us the practical advantage of not needing to out ourselves. We don't need to discuss our sensitive traits, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, in order to get protection because I don't have to be a member of that group or possess the attribute, I just have to suffer negative consequences. And it would also protect misclassified people, so those people who have been grouped with people that they're actually not a part of. So that would be an interesting way forward. The last thing I want to talk about is how AI disrupts the law in the sense of new groups it creates and poses problems to that, which is called group privacy. From a legal perspective, obviously, we have um, a lot of non-discrimination protection, which are usually based on historical experiences. So that means we have protection against um, discrimination based on gender, on sexual orientation, political beliefs, religious beliefs, because we had negative experiences in the past and we don't want those things to reoccur. It makes sense. What if I told you that your credit score is going to drop because you're a video gamer? It sounds very counterintuitive, but it's not completely dystopian or utopian, because it's something, that, something similar is happening in China at the moment. In China, the social credit scoring system is being rolled out, which means that um, the government is using private and public data to assess if somebody is a good citizen. So that means if you're a good citizen, you get benefits, for example, um, better rates at supermarkets. If you're a bad citizen, it could mean that you are on a no-flight list or that your kids are no longer allowed to go to certain schools. Being a video gamer in China is something that drops your credit score. It's something to see that you are a bad citizen. But obviously, this new group, video gamers, don't find protection in the non-discrimination law because they have not been seen as a traditional protected and vulnerable group. So it's very important in the future that we think about group privacy, new group protection that could um, emerge because um, algorithms are grouping us in novel ways that we don't really anticipate. So let me close by saying that I think it's interesting that um, technology is ch challenging us in, in many ways, but we have to think about new creative ways to close the loopholes that we currently have because new challenges are on the horizon. I think with discrimination by association, there's an interesting step to close some of the challenges that we currently have, but we need more transparency of what businesses are actually doing. We need more information about the interest groups um, they would be in place to. I need to know what an algorithm is actually thinking about me. What is it inferring about me? 
And we need more um, transparent business practices. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to prove my case in court that I have been violated, that my rights have been violated. And we need collectively to think about new group privacy protection, protection for uh, untraditional groups that might emerge from that. And I think, again, it sounds negatively, but I'm a very big tech enthusiast. And I think there are many, many exciting opportunities for us in the future. But I think it's very important that we all stick our heads together and think about new creative ways um, to guard against the novel risk of AI. Thank you.